under God's direction, appointed Joshua to be the leader of the people. The leader to take them into the promised land. And God speaks to Joshua. And three times God says to Joshua, Be strong and courageous. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. As I have been with Moses, I will be with you, and I am going to lead you and your people and this people into a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to lead you into this land, and you are going to capture it. For my, my name's sake. I recognize that you're fearful, God says. I recognize that you're trembling. I recognize that at the age of probably 80, because he was at least old enough to go into the land to spy the land out, so he had to be an older man, about 40. And now it's 40 years later, so I figure he's somewhere in the age range between 70 and 80. And now he's being given the command over all of this army, all of these people, some 2 to 3 million people, and he's going to take them into the land that God has given him. And I think if I was being given that responsibility, I'd be a little trembling, fearful myself. Boy, I'm not up to this. I don't know how I'm going to do it. God says, don't worry, I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to lead you and I'm going to do it. But there were two obstacles that was being faced by the people in going into the land. The first obstacle was that of the Jordan River. Now the Jordan River can be very small or it can be very big, depending upon the season of the year. Okay? It, it, can, it can be a mighty flowing river, and so they had to cross that river. Now in Joshua's day, there were no major bridges. There was no easy way to cross the mighty Jordan River. There were small places in the river, there were places in the river where it was shallow enough and still enough with the water flowing that they could walk, people could ford the river, they could walk across the river with their feet on the bottom and, and, and get from one side to the other. There were particular places where that could occur. But that was the first obstacle that they had to face. The second problem that they had is that in the time that they were in or at Mount Zion or Mount Horeb, God had given them a command. God had, and, and, and this command, well actually it had been given back with Abraham, that whenever a male child was born, that male child would be circumcised. And that circumcision was the sign of the covenant between God and His people that they would be in a relationship together. Well, for the 40 years that they have been wandering in the wilderness, there is, uh, has been, no circumcision. So God says to Joshua, look, after I take you across the Jordan River, then all of your males all of your men, all of your soldiers are going to have to be circumcised. I don't remember my circumcision. I was too young. Today it's done in various different ways, but back then they had to take the foreskin and then they had to take a flint knife and cut it off. Very painful experience. An experience that puts you down for a few days as a man when it happens to you. 
And so God says to Moses, Moses, or God says to Joshua, Joshua, when you get on the other side, you're going to have to circumcise. All these men are going to have to be circumcised because they are not in a covenant relationship with me right now. So we're going to have to do that. God, wait a minute. You're taking me into the land of the enemy. You're taking me up close to Jericho, which is a big walled city, full of armed men, and you want me to take my army and incapacitate them for three days or four days. Uh, God, we not only have two obstacles, we've got three obstacles. We've got a city over there. And therefore, we're giants. When you look at the lower storyline, you see how Joshua could be fearful and trembling. How he could lack courage. How he could feel like he was not strong enough to do this. And you look at all of the different things that are happening to Joshua and the people and what God is saying. And, and you can say, wait a minute, this doesn't compute. I'm a pure, poor human being. I can't, I can't think about all of these things. I can't compute this. But Joshua is an obedient servant. Joshua goes to the people and he says, okay, three days from now we're going to break camp on the eastern side of the Jordan River and we are going to cross over to the western side. And we're going to cross over in an area just slightly north of the Dead Sea and we're going to go up and we're going to camp in the, in the flat plain area uh, before the city of Jericho, and we're going to then circumcise ourselves. <clears throat> and then we're going to fight a battle. So Moses and the people, or Joshua and the people, <coughs> follow the Ark of the Covenant, which is being carried by priest and they walk up to the Jordan River. And the first priest that is carrying the Ark of the Covenant, the two at the very front, they are standing on the shoreline of the Jordan River and they step their foot forward. And their foot goes into the water of the Jordan River. And guess what happens? You all know the story. The water stopped. It just stopped flowing. There was no water. There was water, and then there was no water. And the land was dry. Remember the story from 42 years before? How did they come out of Egypt? On dry land, walking through the water. They entered the Promised Land, crossing the Jordan River, walking on dry land, with the water stopped. So all of that huge crowd of people crosses the Jordan River on dry land. What does that say to the people living in the land? We got a problem. <laughs> so everyone crosses. They set up camp on the western side of the Jordan River. And then they proceed to circumcise all of the men. And the only able-bodied people in that camp are the women. Because all the men are laid up in pain. They're open to any invading army that wants to come and attack them. 
And they would all be destroyed because the men were not going to be able to fight about it. After the men are somewhat well, Joshua puts God's plan into action. And he makes preparations to attack the city of Jericho. And he follows God's plan of action. God has said to him, Take your armed men, put the Ark of the Covenant in front of them, take seven priests and give them horns, and for seven days I want you, or for six days I want you to march one time around the city of Jericho. The priests who are carrying the horns are going to blow the horns. The Ark of the Covenant is going to follow them. And the Ark is going to be surrounded by your soldiers. And you're going to walk around and nobody's going to say a word. The only thing that's going to be there is the sound of the trumpets. Now, I know that when you have 600,000 men walking, and if they are all walking in time with each other, okay, everybody taking a step at the same time, that you can set up a vibration and a lot of things can happen. You can destroy a bridge. You put men on a, on a bridge, I don't care what kind of bridge it is, and you make every one of them walk, and a vibration gets set up, and that bridge is going to Come. Now, I don't know whether they walked in route step, which is everybody just walking around, or whether they all marched together. I have no idea how that march occurred. But nobody said a word. And for seven days, six days, they marched around the city. One day. One, one, one round a day. And then, on the seventh day, God says, okay, now you're going to do it seven times. You're going to have the trumpet sounding and you're going to walk around the city seven times. And on the seventh time when you start making that circuit, everybody that has been quiet for these seven days is now going to shout. The trumpets are going to blare and everybody's going to shout and the walls are going to come tumbling down. I asked Bill this morning, are you going to sing Joshua Fit the Battle of Jericho <laughs> as your special? He said, I thought about it, but I'm not. <laughs> but we all know the song, don't we? Joshua Fit the Battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. What would it have been like to be a soldier on that seventh day and to see those walls that had built, been built up that were probably anywhere from uh, 15 to 25 feet above your head. You're walking around the city, you're looking up at this fortified city and all you can see is wall. And the people up on the top of the walls that are looking down at you look kind of like they're in up there. You look like ants down there. What would it have been like to see all of those walls start falling? Falling outward so that there was a smooth grade and you could come running up that grade with your 600,000 men and our swords are out and they are going to kill everybody in the city except Rahab. Everybody in that city is going to die. That was God's battle plan. On earth, on the lower, lower story, looks kind of daunting. Why would God take us across the river dry? Why would God command us 
to be circumcised. And why would God give us the victory? Let's go back to the upper story. Let's look at the upper story for a couple of minutes. Upper story. God has a plan. 600 years before this, God has said to Abraham, their father, Abraham, I'm going to bring your people from a land of captivity where they have lived for 400 years. I am going to bring them out and I'm going to take them to a land that I'm going to give to them. And the reason that I am waiting for 400 years or for, or for some 600 years because you have to go back 200 years to Abraham before Joseph and all that. God says, look, I am waiting for the sin of the people living in the land I am going to give my people. I am waiting for their sin to be filled up. This is my plan, Joseph, uh, Abraham. I am going to bring your descendants into a land that I am going to give to them because the sins of the people in that land have so desecrated my land where I am going to put my name that I am going to punish them and I am going to wipe them out because of their sin. God has planned. God allowed the Amorites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Gergeshites and all those Shiites that lived in his land to remain there until their sin had completely filled up God's bucket. And then God was going to exact His wrath, His punishment. So God takes His people out through dry land. He brings them in on dry land because that's His plan. Now why did He have all of the men circumcised? As we read the story in chapter 7 we find that Joshua stood up to the people and said, Look, we are God's people. God has given to us a standard by which we are to live. He gave it to us through Moses. We have His laws. We are now part of His relationship. We are entering into the land in order to be a covenant people with God we must be circumcised. We must be completely dedicated to God. We must re-enter into that covenant that God made with our ancestor at <coughs> excuse me, what God made with our ancestor Abraham and we are going to become part of that relationship now and we are going to commit ourselves, commit our lives through the act of circumcision of living for God in this new land that God has given us. This was God's desire for His people. And God says, you can't enter into my land that I am going to give to you without being in a true covenant relationship with me. Just can't do it. So we've got to go through the act of circumcision. Don't worry about that. I'll take care of you. There ain't nobody going to attack you while you're incapacitated. God has planned. And God wants His people to be consecrated to Him. To live for Him. To be dedicated to Him. And to show it outwardly through the act of circumcision. And through a life that is lived in accordance with His commands. You see, as God brought His people into the land, He wasn't so much as giving them the land as He was taking it away from the other people that had corrupted His land and had desecrated His land. Moses had reminded the people before they went into the promised land, said, look, God has not chosen you because you are a righteous people. God has not chosen you because you are, are living for Him. God has not chosen you because you are His special people. God has chosen you because He has a task for you to do. And that task is to go in 
and punish the people living in the land. We get all concerned about whether God is righteous and, and God is a just God or anything else when we talk about God's punishment and God's justice and God's judgment. But God is a just God. He is a righteous God. He is a God who allowed the people to live in the land and they in 600 years never changed their lives. They were sacrificing to other gods. They were offering their children fire uh, through child sacrifice. They were living in immorality, sexual immorality, all kinds of immorality. And God was saying, they are going to be punished. I am going to punish them for their sin. You, Israel, are no more righteous than they are. But I am going to use you, Israel, to punish them for their sin. You are my instrument of punishment. God has planned. God destroyed the city of Jericho so that the people in the land who worshipped other gods would know that God is the only God. When the children of Israel took the land, when they captured the land, when they defeated all of the kings that are described in, in, in the book of Joshua, when they did all that God had commanded them to do, then, God had a place for all the world to know that He was the true God, the only God. Because no other God had ever delivered a people from the hand of another set of gods, brought them through the desert and into the promised land, no other God had ever done that. No other God had ever caused a city to fall before an attacking army. And God used His people to make a place where His name could be known throughout the world. You see, as we look at the book of Joshua, we look at it from a human perspective. We look at it from a from a, a, a human level, from the lower level story. And we say, oh, it doesn't make sense to us. Why would God do this? Why did God take people out through the waters and bring them in through the waters? You know, Rahab said it. He's a God that can do anything. He's greater than all of the gods that we worship in this land. Your God is God. And I fear him. And because she feared him, she and her family were allowed to live. But God's name was made known by his mighty acts. You and I have a story also. Our story isn't quite like the story here. But you know, as we walk through life, as we have been dedicated to Him, as we have committed our lives to Him in acceptance of, of God and His Son, Jesus Christ, God is walking with us. God is going before us. We can look at the waters of the Dead Sea or the Reed Sea, and we can look at the waters of the Jordan River, and we can say those were huge obstacles, and God cleared a way for His people. You know, we have obstacles in our life. It might be financial. It might be physical or medical. It might be psychological. We have objects that are standing in our way of going in and receiving all of the promises of God. Do you know if God can part the waters of the Red Sea and the waters of the Jordan River? We can trust Him.
to deal with the problems of life that we are faced with. doesn't matter what that problem is. God can deal with it. One of my problems that I face in my life is my depression. And I take medication for it. And people say, well, why do you take medication? Don't you have enough faith? Yeah, I have enough faith. I have faith that God has given me a medical person that can look at me, can evaluate me, and can give me the medications I need to help me stay on I need a cue. I wear glasses. I'm getting hearing aids. Do I need to have enough faith and my eyes are going to be made well? You see, there's nothing in life that God can't do, that God can't handle. We just have to walk with Him. He'll make the way. Circumcision. Circumcision is no longer an issue for us as believers. But to walk with God, to walk with Jesus Christ, in keeping with His laws, in keeping with His demands in our lives, when we walk in obedience with Him, when we are committed to Him, then we can be a light to the world. Just as the children of Israel was to be a light to the world in the land that God gave them. It was a land where God wanted to, the people of the world to know, I am God. And whenever you come in contact with my people, who are my holy people, who are my priesthood, whenever you come in contact with my people, then you will know that I am God. There's a point in time, though, that his people are sometimes disobedient. And they don't receive the full blessings that God has in store for his obedient people. You know, we can make wrong decisions. During Sunday school class this morning, we're going to talk about Achan and his wrong decision. Okay? We're going to talk about him. He made a wrong decision, and he missed out on the blessings of whatever was to come. But he focused on the wrong thing. His focus was on the earth. Because his focus was down here. God dealt with him. And he missed all the blessings. He missed everything else that came. You and I can make wrong decisions. But you know, we have a God who is a forgiving God, a loving God. And when we make a wrong decision, when we turn to Him and we come back to Him in faith and we say, God, forgive me, guess what? We're forgiven. Because God wants His people to be a light to the world so that the world can know that He is truly God. And you know, the children of Israel were faced with giants in the land. They looked on all of the people that were living in that land of, that God was going to give to them, and all they could see was giants. If the land was good enough to make two men have to carry a cluster of grapes, how much bigger are the men that live in that land than that cluster of grapes? You understand the comparison here? If the fruit harvest, is, if, if one harvest is just, just one big group of grapes and, and, and you've got to carry it with two men, then the people that live in that land have got to be superhuman. When we look at it from the lower story, we look at the giants. All we can see is giants. But you know what? When you look at it from the upper story, God is bigger than all of those giants. My God is bigger than that giant. I don't care whether he's called Goliath. I don't care whether he's called the city of of uh, uh, Jericho, it doesn't matter who it is, my God is bigger than all of the giants that I am going to face in my life. All I have to do is follow Him and be obedient to Him. He'll take care of the giants. I don't have to worry about them. 
The giants are going to fall. Once again, what are the giants? It can be anything. It can be anything that wants to keep us from focusing on God. And my God is strong enough and big enough to take care of any giant that I might have in my life. The upper story and the lower story. The battle begins. Whenever we come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, the battle begins. The battle begins and we are to face it. We are to face it not in our own strength, not in our own courage, not in fear. Over 100 times in the Bible, the Bible of God says to His people, do not be afraid. Do not fear one way or the other. Fear not, saith the Lord, for I am with you. He is Lord. He is Lord. Let us pray. Father, You are truly Lord. You are truly God. You are truly King of kings, Lord of lords. You are truly Master of our lives. And Lord, as we live our lives down here on this earth and as we look at the, the lower story of, of Joshua and the people of Israel going into your promised land, we can learn, Father, that you are truly Lord, that you can make our way straight, that you can do away with all the obstacles in our lives that are keeping us from being the people of God that you would have us to be, that you can call us to rededicate ourselves to you so that we can be and we can live in accordance with your teachings, that we can be a light to the world, that we can be bread to the world, that we can be the water as we present to them the water to the world around us, the water of life. Lord, you can do all things and you are truly Lord. Father, as we look at the things, the obstacles, the, the giants in our lives that seem to want to defeat us, we can turn to you and in assurance and in faith and in wonder watch you defeat the enemy. Father, you are truly Lord. You are truly God. And we praise you.